I'm going to talk about the strategic story. First, I just want to say a word about the ClimateWorks Foundation. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, ClimateWorks uh, supports public policies that can reduce carbon emissions and promote prosperity around the world. Um, we work in the regions and sectors where most carbon comes from. So our theory of change is that um, you need to look for high leverage opportunities for philanthropy to reduce carbon emissions. And um, these are the places, China, India, Indonesia, Europe, the United States, and primarily Brazil and Latin America, where about 80% of carbon emissions uh, originate. Um, and in those places, in these sectors, so in the power sector, with some wind, wind turbines down there, uh, the industrial sector, the building sector, which is both buildings, the built environment, and the appliances that operate inside those buildings, and then the transportation sector, which is vehicles, fuel economy, technology for cars and stuff, and uh, transit-oriented development, mass transit, urban planning, and that sort of thing. And finally, forests, um, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, about 20% of emissions globally come from deforestation and ag-related practices. And um, the, the fact is, is that if you want to get to what we define as a win on climate change, which is trying to cap carbon emissions at a, at a level that doesn't exceed 2 degrees centigrade increase in temperature, um, you got to get all the carbon in these places. If you go over that, you lose, and that includes for any one of these sectors. Um, so we fund NGOs in all of these regions and all of these sectors who focus specifically on the policies that reduce those emissions in those, in those places. Um, so communications, well, what is communications really? My definition, and I'll say that this is mine, so it's also subject to challenge or debate, but it's using stories to influence or change behavior. Um, and, I, and I sort of say that as strategic storytelling. Um, People essentially, everything is a story, and I'll talk a little bit more about how people define their lives as stories. Um, I think that's something that this crowd is particularly familiar with, um, but I, I, I just want to emphasize that point. So what I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through a word on science, and I mean the science of how people actually understand things. And I, I think the, that there's some people in this room who are um, orders of magnitude more informed than I am on this, so this is a place where I wouldn't mind being challenged uh, afterwards, but I'll go through that a little bit. Um, there's a, there's a message continuum in communications. There's different levels of attention that people have. I'll talk about that for a couple minutes. And then identifying messengers is really important. I want to go as deep as I can in the limited time on messengers, because um, that's a really important topic. Um, so a quick word on science. And, and by science, I mean um, the, the science of communication. So this is a, about a scale model of the human brain. Um, you might recognize this is a great American hero, um, Homer Simpson. Um, and the key concepts that, that we, we in the communications profession have to always keep in mind are attention, working memory, and chunks. And for those of you who are familiar with psycholinguistics, chunks is actually a technical term. It refers to how much information can the brain process at any given time. Someone mentioned the other day, attention is a limited resource, and we all have experienced that. Um, you know, with the, with the famous experiments where two people witness a car crash and describe completely different things, uh, it's because they were paying attention to something different. And one of the things that uh, the, the people in this room have done a lot of research on is, well, what are the factors that get people to pay attention to one thing and not another? But the key, the key component of attention is that it's incredibly finite. You don't really get much of anyone's attention if you get any of it at all. Um, and so when you're talking about communicating with them, you really need to be thinking about restricting the amount of information you're giving them, to them at any given moment, because uh, they just can't take it all in. And this is actually an incredible shortcoming of the movement, as we, as we tend to think, oh, if people just have more information, they're going to make the right decision. I wanted to note the irony of that, because that, that's, that's an argument for an economic man, um, which we all know doesn't actually exist. <laughs> um, working memory, that's the stuff that we're, you know, right now you're hearing me, you're taking the words in uh, through your ears, and you're processing that, and your brain has to actually verbatim transpose what I'm saying to you so that you can understand and translate the words into symbols in your mind and result in meaning um, and so on. That's a process that takes time and it's a finite resource as well. Um, and chunks in particular, um, chunks is how many little bits of information can you take in? This is sort of the RAM concept uh, from computers. Um, it's that, you know, there's, somebody correct me if the number's wrong, I think seven chunks is the average, is that right? Seven chunks? So. Plus or minus two, thank you. And then in incredible cases, you can get people who get up to 12 or something like that. But it's very unusual. And chunks are, are like bits of information. It's, it's new stuff that people can take in at one time and actually absorb and process. And so one example that I like to use is why are there dashes in phone numbers? Because people can remember little chunks of numbers, not long strings of numbers. And the same is true for information. Um, 
So uh, I'm, I'm gonna accelerate this a little bit just to get through some of this. Um, I've talked about working memory. There's a, there's a few different parts of memory that are in operation. Um, it operates over a few seconds. This is so you're processing what I'm saying right now. Uh, you have temporary storage where you're sort of figuring out what it is that I mean. Um, you take that information and you, and you, and you manipulate it. Um, and then finally, you've, you've, it's in your attention and you said, oh, I, I heard Matt just say that um, I've captured your attention, so thanks for listening. Um, uh, one of the common problems we face is too many chunks. Um, this is something I do with one of my grantees. This is an actual headline from a report that they wrote. I'm gonna read it so you can hear, um, try to make sense of it. The role of forward capacity markets in increasing demand side and other low carbon resources, experiences and prospects. Now this is actually a pretty important concept in, in the power sector. Um, demand side management is a big deal. This is where a huge amount of carbon is located, is in this concept right here. But, Take this headline and show it to anybody who's not what I call a deep nerd. What the heck are they talking about? There's some things about that this is gonna get into some strategic storytelling. That same concept could be rephrased in a way, something like this. This is the consequence of demand side management. This is also one of the, these are the beneficiaries of demand side management. But it's how you actually tell the story is very different depending on who you think you're talking to. So if you're just going to a utility regulator and trying to make the case and they've already been convinced, you're gonna say here's all the system benefits of your, of, your, uh, of your demand side management program. But typically we need to try to convince people who are not experts first. So that includes politicians and governors and business leaders and so on. And so the question is, is what are the different ways you can tell that story in a way that's gonna connect with people who actually can move to it? And there's some examples right now in the US where Building contractors and electricians are in fact calling for utility investments um, in, in local jobs. It's a, it's a growing efficiency movement. There's, a, there's one organization called Efficiency First. It's a national organization of building contractors and electricians and HVAC operators who, are, who went to Congress and wrote a bill called the Homestar Program. Um, I don't know that it's gotten very far, but it, it moved incredibly fast. And one of the reasons it moved so fast is because nobody wants to go against their local building contractors. Nobody wants to go against their electricians. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know that it's succeeded. Somebody who's closer to DC can tell me what happened to Homestar. Yeah, I'm getting the nod. No, it didn't work out. But, that's, <laughs> but, the, but the point was it went from zero to 60 in about eight months. The organization didn't exist. They wrote a bill in about three months. They got it into Congress in like the next five, and suddenly it was the hottest thing in DC. And one of the reasons that is is because they, they told the story in a way that connected with people. Um, so the lesson is keep it simple. Um, and, and this is sort of going back to the initial piece about science. Um, the how you frame these concepts, and you hear the term framing a lot. I don't, you know, framing means, it means a bunch of things, but it's essentially how are you casting the story with actual stories about people who matter to other people who have the decision-making power? Because ultimately the conversation we're having is, is one about power, and I think we get a little bit dodgy in, in, in this community about explaining that that's what we're really talking about, is who has the power? People can, people can change their behavior, but if you can't get your utility to change how they're sourcing their electrons, you don't really get there with just behavior change. You need it. It's a necessary but not sufficient component of reducing carbon emissions. If you get enough people to say, I don't want my utility to buy coal power anymore, though then they still have to vote for a governor who's gonna appoint utility commissioners or vote for the utility commissioner who's not gonna let that utility keep investing in coal power. Fortunately, we have some examples where this has really worked. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is about how long before the brain starts making judgment about trust. Which says what? That you really gotta think about who's doing the talking. Now this is not a, you know, this is a, it's a precognitive function and you can't build trust. It's not that this is a universal rule where nobody will trust you. But, but th the fact is, is that this is something that brains do and you can build trust after that moment. But one of the important things is, is, is thinking about in terms of who's doing the talking, that if they're talking to someone who they're trying to persuade, they should, they should ideally look and sound or at least share values and culture with the person they're trying to convince. And this is a, this is a concept that the, that the environmental movement has started to grasp recently but is realizing they're in a bit of a bind because they are environmentalists and they're branded as environmentalists and they are working for environmental organizations. And for them to go and try to work with ranchers or with labor groups or with sportsmen, which is some work that's been going on, is very tricky because ranchers and labor groups and sportsmen 
aren't necessarily going to look to environmental groups for guidance or even want to talk, you know, what's, what's the value connection? What do they have in common? Um, we have seen some examples where this has worked, but I think it's important. Um, what I'm going to set up is there are other ways to approach this work. Some people have talked about it really effectively over the last couple of days. It's been, it's been heartening to see. Um, but this is an important thing to keep in mind. Some recent research from Tufts, and I actually, this is one of my questions. Um, somebody claimed that people can actually gauge someone's political affiliation by their face. Um, is anyone familiar with this study? Did anyone see this? Anyway, it it's, it's sort of reinforces this notion that people are making judgments before a single word has come out of somebody's mouth. And I think we all know that that's often true. So um, the challenge and the opportunity from this is many scientists, and I mean climate scientists in particular who I've worked with a lot, but others as well, and advocates of smart policies do not understand these concepts. They don't know that they, they're not working within the limited attention spans. They're not recognizing that people are making judgments about trust in a, in, a, in a millisecond. And so there is still this concept that more information will get people to make the right decision. And I think we need to back up from that and say, isn't it really important to, to, to frame things in terms of somebody's values and have them connecting with someone who they relate to first and then start to have a conversation about what needs to happen to to, bring, to talk about the transformative change we're talking about. Um, within that, you know, there's, this is a, something that I've, I sort of threw together um, in a panic. I had a meeting at the Hewlett Foundation, and they were challenging one of our programs, and I had to figure out some graph that would explain what it was I was talking about. So I came up with this. Um, the, the message, sort of the message continuum. So, so this is everyday life. So this is picking up the kids and taking them to school and uh, going to your job and um, groceries and bills and avoiding the boss and everything. This is sort of marketing and strategic communication. So we're bombarded with messages every day. And some of them break through, but most of them don't. Um, then this is what I call a sort of random stuff and black swans. So, so you know, if you're up here operating in everyday life and there's you know, uh, flooding in Australia, you know, maybe you don't hear about it. It's not, it doesn't cross your radar. But there's an oil spill in in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, that's going to break through. Everybody's paying attention to that. So the, the reason I wanted to put this up there for a second is that there's varying levels of investment, and I mean in terms of dollars, that it takes to reach through to one of these layers. So as you can imagine, this is actually really inexpensive relatively. So the East Anglia scandal, OK? Emails got stolen, made a huge splash in the media. Everybody talked about it. Nobody spent any money on that. That didn't cost our, the, the opponents of climate action really anything to, to make that happen. But it made this huge splash, and it broke through and got all these messages through for a, an extended period of time. Conversely, where you really want to be getting change to happen, and this is something that Rachel talked about and a couple others have talked about, is up here. It's reaching people in their everyday lives. You want, you want to be thinking, you want them to be thinking, and I, don't even, I shouldn't even say want them to be thinking, but we need to craft programs and activities that are a part of their everyday lives. They make it so that, oh, th this choice that I've made, I made without anybody even telling me um, because it it's naturally fits into what I'm doing. And so where a lot of advocacy tends to focus is in here, right? We're trying to break through, oh, we got the story in the New York Times, thanks, Andy. Um, uh, you know, now we can do, do it again in six months. And there's just a problem with that. It just doesn't work. Messages only work when they're repeated over and over and over and over and over again. And as much as the Times or the Washington Post or any outlet is covering these issues, the fact is you just don't get that kind of message repetition through media in a way that reaches your audience over and over and over again. You really need to be playing up here if you're going to be reaching people in a way that, that matters. And so there's, there's a couple things I want to talk about about how to do that. Um, I'll just skip through some of this stuff. Um, so oftentimes people will come to me with, when they're looking for help and say, you know, we're, we're crafting this campaign or we've written a report. And Matt, we want you to figure out what the message is and help us get it out. And I'll look at them and just be like, well, how, how much time did you spend on the report? Oh, a year and a half. Oh, how much money did you spend on the report? Oh, you know, about $100,000. Oh, no. When's it coming out? Next week. And I think, oh, my god. you know, what, who, How are you really going to reach the people you're trying to reach when you haven't even thought about reaching them until a week before you're putting the report out? Um, this is a really chronic problem. It happens all the time. And, and what I say to people is, if you haven't started from day one, before you even wrote the report, thinking about who you're trying to reach and what's going to move them, you've failed. You've already failed. Because not every message is going to reach every audience. And if you're saying, this is what I want to say, and damn it, they're going to listen to me and hear it, 
you've, you've failed. And I think that this is a commentary about a lot of what we've been doing is we know the answer, right? We know which policies we need to enact to get action. The problem is we're starting with a, here's the policy, what's it gonna take you to come along with me and support this? And it's just an upside down way of doing communications. It's an upside down way of doing advocacy. Um, and we have to turn that line around and come to people in a different way. And so I wanna talk a little bit about ways to do that and some ways that have really worked. So the, the most important thing about communications is, is you know, obviously you've gotta know what it is you wanna to try to achieve. What's your goal is a, is a question that a, communi a, a good communications professional should always ask for is what's your goal, what's your goal, what's your goal, and get really clear on that. But I think we have a pretty good sense of what our goal is. Then the question is who's your target audience? Um, is it conservative hunters in the Rockies? Is it people working in factories? Is it uh, people in the military or families? Um, is it ranchers? Whoever it is, you know, know your audience and understand their values. Um, because I think one of the things, one of the traps we fall into is we sort of think that people who oppose us have values that are necessarily counter to ours, and that's just not true. Um, in fact, measurably not true. Um, and, uh, and there's some thing, really interesting research out of the Rockies over the last few days, about two weeks ago, that, it's, that sort of reinforces this. And um, I, I have done a lot of work in that area, so I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, so it's, it's useful to have data about values and core concerns. Um, obviously, jobs and economy often are the top of people's concerns, but you know, you got, also got to remember to ask the right question. Um, this, is, this is some research that John Krosnick at Stanford did uh, about what are people's long-term concerns. It was an open-ended question, and the number one long-term concern that people came up with was environmental damage and global warming. This was unprompted. So it's, we sort of think, oh man, nobody was really worried about this, and how do we get them to be with us? And the question I have is, you know, I think people are aware that we have a problem. It's just not their number one problem, and there's a difference there. And so the question is, how can we start to work with them to understand what is your number one problem? Because obviously building these kinds of you know, relationships are what lead to progress. And again, I want to point to the good work that Rachel showed us earlier. That was really amazing. That's, that's, that's one of the pathways to get there. Um, the messengers have to be credible. And so what that means essentially is they've got to be in the group. Uh, we talked on, on yesterday, I think, about in groups and, and um, how do they work and how do you, how do you understand what their values are. Uh, and you can't recruit someone who looks like a rancher and then go put them with a bunch of ranchers and think that's going to work. You need to find a group of ranchers who, and, and really understand what it is they care about. And this is some work that's happened uh, really successfully in the Rockies. So the building blocks of a strategic story is you know, attention matters. You really have to know your audience. Um, identify messengers and build stories around them. I mean, stories are about people. So if your story doesn't have a person in it, it's really not a story. Um, the, you want to craft a narrative that's, that's effective, and then you repeat, 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 repeat. Messages only work when they're repeated. Um, the other way that I say that is that you have to repeat messages in order for them to be effective. Um, there's one other way to say that, which is when you repeat messages, they can have the impact you're trying to have with them. So, <laughs> um, so I want to just tell a quick story about the Rocky Mountains. Um, so about not quite 10 years ago, uh, President Bush started signing a series of executive orders that opened up vast swaths of land to natural gas drilling across the Rockies. Um, uh, the, of course, the first to hear about this were environmentalists who were just shocked. I mean, this was literally hundreds of thousands of acres of land that had been off limits um, that was now open to development. This is actually a, a shot from not so long ago in Wyoming. This is what much of the Rockies are going to look like um, when, uh, when the drilling boom is done. There was a problem though, well, among many problems, um, a lot of the act areas that were opened up for this drilling was in prime elk habitat. Um, and so the environmental movement started to sort of organize around, oh, well, you gotta stay out of this habitat, but they were focusing on some flowers and some butterflies and that sort of, and it, seriously, there were, they were filing uh, endangered species briefs about endangered flowers and butterflies. Um, meanwhile, I, I lived in Colorado for a long time, and many of my friends were elk hunters, and I started calling some of them. I was working as a media consultant. I started calling them and saying, hey, you guys, what's going on with the drilling? What are you guys doing? And, and they were panicked. And I mean, one of my friends was literally in tears. He'd, he'd, there was an area he'd been hunting in with his father for 20 years, and there was a drill rig in the, in the drainage. And he went up there, and he was like, I can't believe it. There's never going to be elk here again. Um, and this was a deep, deep emotional connection these guys had to the areas where they lived and where they'd hunted for a long time. The problem was uh, the movement had completely alienated them because they were aligned with people for the ethical treatment of animals and they, you know, they associated environmentalists with vegetarianism and they were just like, you know, 
you, they, they, it didn't, they, they, were, they felt like there was an assault on their values underway from other battles from history. So even though this wasn't about anything related to meat consumption, uh, they just didn't want to talk to environmentalists. But there was an opportunity to help organize them because they were really passionate about this and they just didn't know where to turn. So we organized groups of sportsmen from across the Rockies um, because the drilling was happening everywhere. And I swear to God, I went, I went and did these trainings for these folks, first explaining to them what policies were allowing this to happen. And you, know, you had to spend some time understanding, well, I was up there and I talked to this uh, guide and he said he saw this. And they were, they were way ahead of me. They were way ahead of everybody in terms of what the concerns were. But they were just so deeply emotionally distraught that anyone could ever allow this to happen in, in, in the area that they'd been hunting. Um, and at the same time, what we started to explain was where that natural gas was going. It was largely going to make electricity somewhere else. Now, we couldn't make the direct connection between the gas coming out of, say, Sublet County in Wyoming and electric generator in California, but there was a really good chance that it was. And we pointed out that there's alternatives. And it wasn't just wind turbines. These are on the front range of Colorado. But you know, this notion that energy efficiency can reduce demand for natural gas, this notion that solar panels can reduce demand for natural gas, and they got it. They didn't, it didn't need any explanation. It was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's energy that's going to one place, it's going to another place. Um, and so it started to build momentum around that. And they got a lot of really good press because hunting is a, it's not a huge pastime in the Rockies, but it's a popular pastime. Nobody really hates hunters there. They're, everybody knows one. Um, and so it started to build, you know, sort of a mem around this notion of the conservationist, the sort of what's the old term is the Rocky Mountain liberal. Um, these are people who tend libertarian, but they, you know, they're, they're, they, they live there for the land. They love the land and they really care about it deeply. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit and, and sort of close the story. Um, this is a poll from two weeks ago. 70% of Colorado voters support EPA reducing carbon emissions. This is Republican and Democrat. Um, and two thirds of voters in Montana, New Mexico, and Utah, 56% in Wyoming said they supported. This, I want to explain that Dick, Dick Cheney comes from Wyoming. <laughs> Wyoming is the source of most of the coal used in the United States. Wyoming has the largest natural gas boom going on in the United States. And 56% of Wyoming residents want to see the EPA reduce carbon emissions. Now, this is polling data. There's a difference between answering the question, saying, yeah, I want to see it, and then actually voting on it. And that's a really important distinction. But the point is, when you ask the question, they're with us. So what I want to sort of leave you with is this, is this idea that, you know, we might not be as far away from folks and values as they seem, as we seem. And it's really a question of going in and understanding what is it that they care about? What are their values and core concerns? And that more, as, as often as not, we'll find that there actually really is overlap. And I, and I, wanna, I, I wanna end, I've got um, a little quick thing I wanna show. And then uh, the, the, the notion that, that there's this huge, vast uh, uh, population of people who don't believe in climate change and who are opposed to doing anything on it is largely manufactured. There's a very vocal, and successful base of people who don't believe in the climate change, the climate is changing and who oppose any action to do it. There's just not that many of them. They have some very large and successful channels, and I don't think I need to name what those channels are in terms of in terms of promoting what they're Roger Ailes lives in this town. Roger Ailes owns the newspaper in this town. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's not the same thing as having significant support wherever you go. I mean, I wanted, this Wyoming number is really stunning. If anybody's ever been to Wyoming, it is not, this is, there's not really any liberals in Wyoming. There's a couple in Jackson and a couple in Lander, and, you know. Um, so I guess I just, I wanna, I wanna close by pointing out that there's a really good chance we're much closer to the people who we say we're trying to reach than we think we are. But part of the problem is that we are trying to reach them as opposed to helping them understand how they are already somewhere that they might not be aware that they are in terms of their emotional and their value system. And that, that those, those, those triggers, those things that can cause, bring, bring them to action are, are potentially just beneath the surface. Um, in this case, this was, you know, this is a pretty easy case. Hunters, their elk were threatened. They got active and they started, they started supporting the first ever ballot initiative renewable energy standard in the country passed in Colorado. Um, Colorado just recently voted to shut six coal-fired power plants on the Front Range. Their PUC is shutting coal plants, one of the first states in the country to shut active coal plants. Um, and we were able to take over the Public Utility Commission with advocates of clean energy. 
Um, so these are, these are real changes that have happened that are reducing carbon emissions as a result of people connecting with the values of the people who live in a place and them really seeing, I can do something. Um, so the final thing I want to say, and this is really for fun, kind of, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but this just, I have to show this to you. This is really cool if it's going to play, hopefully. Thanks. This has just so captured what we've been talking about. Um, and you know, again, people do have these values. There's ways to connect with them. And um, I guess I'll stop there. So thanks a lot. <laughs>